I sadly have to do a bunch of flying coming up soon. Flying? Which, yeah. Why is that sad? I like flying. I mean, yeah, but like, it, it it's such a time suck. A time suck. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but everything is when you're traveling, right? Yeah. Well, I get to drive like 30 hours. Yeah, and then I get to uh, also drive 30 hours. Well, that's true, but just one way. It's not yeah. too bad. Also, um, I'm not sure if anyone who is listening has ever been to uh, the Mall of America. Uh, I have, and it is a uh, cursed place. It's the one in Minneapolis, right? Yes, uh, and if you ever want to go to a place that has five lids, lids as in the hat store. Oh, uh, lids. It's yeah. like five roofs. That's kind of weird. No, no, they have five lids, the hat stores. Uh, dispersed across the entire mall, or at least last time I was there, that was the case. What's the one in D.C. called? Like the the Great Mall or something? The National Mall? The National Mall, right. Yeah. Maybe they think they can get on their marketing better, you know, like throw a couple lids in there. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, Neil Armstrong spacesuit lids. Yeah, you know. the uh, Whatever the Wright Brothers flew, then a lids. The, the Holocaust Museum, then, then a lid. Then a lid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Well, uh, welcome back to Clio Talk, our podcast uh, where we talk about Clio. Uh, I'm RC. And I'm Matt. And today we have a new topic for you, which is not public transit in Kansas City. It is highways in Kansas City. It's an article by Daniel Herridges. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. And it's called Kansas City's Blitz, How Freeway Building Blew Up Urban Wealth. I'd like to uh, first apologize for the lack of content. Uh, we, I moved, and then uh, RC here uh, got the unspoken virus. Yeah. So, Not in that order, but yeah, we've been kind of put out for about three weeks now, which is why we haven't produced an episode in about three weeks now. So now we're going to do the lazy one where we just chat and read someone else's work. Well, some say lazy, some say fun. I say yeah. fun. I'll, I'll say fun and lazy. Yeah, I think I think this is a nice change of pace from a regular scripted content because these are a little bit easier to produce. We get to put a little bit more personality into it, and we just have fun with it. So, so Jesus. I kicked my microphone. Well, I guess the story we... of Kansas City is the story of America's suburban experiment in microcosm. Yes. By the end of World War II in 1945, the city was not yet a century old, but had become an internationally famous hub for music, theater, and food, and built a proud heritage of elegant buildings, parks, providing wealth for a city that was steadily growing denser, taller within its existing footprint, and the skeletal system of a city during its time was its expansive streetcar network. Now, we have talked about Kansas City Streetcar Network before. Actually, famously, our last episode was, in fact, about yes. the Kansas City Streetcar Network. It, it, it's almost like we harp on like one point about It's our almost home city. like this entire other series was just to talk about yeah. <laughs> this topic. To talk about how cars were in Kansas City. We just wanted some kind of outlet to complain about it in our history podcast. Yes. Uh, well... The streetcars laid the foundation for neighborhoods that still harbor a disappropriate concentration of Kansas City's real estate value and architecture heritage today. Now, I don't know if you've pulled up this article to read along with us, but there is a picture that I have never seen before, right front and center, that is of Kansas City as they were in 1957 when they were preparing to build the downtown Loop Freeway that goes straight through the middle of the city. I've never seen this photograph before, but they have demolished, like... The entire, like, it's just flat terrain. They've built the bridges that are going to go. That is it's just insane. An incre it's, like, it's like a rolling, like, it got carpet bombed. And, and, and today, I mean, the highway they've built here, I think, is the one that's buried, right? But no. No, 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 no. This is North Loop because they end up building another one uh, mm. just down... Uh, you can actually see the uh, municipal center. In oh, because that, that's the power and light. That, building, that's right the power there, and light building. It? So, uh, and that's the building where they took off all the cladding of, oh, on it no. because it used to have that decorative cladding, and then they stripped it all off in the nineteen right, sixties. Right, right. um, yeah, it sucked. Um, no, so this is they now they have two of those. 
Right. And uh, that's that's the North Loop that because that's River Market. Uh, but that's obviously for people who are not wanting to look at the picture. Uh, it is imagine a normal city, but with a block and a half of the middle of it just completely leveled. I mean, there's just nothing. It, it looks like it got bombed. It's incredible. I've, I've never seen, and I, I knew that they, people, like we talk about yeah. highway construction. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, you have to demolish bits, put the highway in. Like you see on the map, those animated lines of like, here's the highway expanse, but I've never seen a photo like this before. And, and the weird thing is you can, uh, so as Kansas City natives, you understand that if you're downtown, 19th and Vine seems so far away. Yeah. But you can see it in the photo. You see that baseball field? It's right yeah. over there. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, so really with that picture, it just the disconnect from the current Kansas City is drastic because of these highways. Let's get off the point. Let's read the article. Okay. So after World War II, Kansas City made a drastic pivot in its development approach. Today, its state line straddling metropolitan areas contender not for the streetcar capital, but the freeway capital of the United States. For years, Metro Kansas City had far more lanes of freeway per capita than any other. It now comes in a very close second to Nashville on a per capita basis, and Kansas City still has 50% more total miles. I didn't know that. I didn't I, know we were that highway dependent. I, I also didn't know that, but also like I it doesn't mean, surprise me. But what, we have six thirty five, four thirty five, yeah. I thirty five, yeah. I seventy. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's a loop for I seventy or not because there's already so many highways. Yeah, then there's a bunch of there's I twenty nine. I guess in fairness, if you're gonna build an intercontinental highway system, yeah. We're, I mean, we're the middle, right? And I'm, I'm also uh, wondering if uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the man who uh, signed the Interstate Highway Act, was uh, focusing on hmm. uh, probably the closest major city to him when he grew up as a child in uh, Abilene, Kansas. Might have been. Might have been. I've I been, mean, we do have. I guess if it's if you're looking at the highway as like a military thing, we do yeah. have Fort Leavenworth. There's that Air Force base. What is it? A uh, Whiteman? Yes. Uh, uh, we're in decent areas for centralization, but still, I think that's a bit excessive. Yeah. And you know, Matt, every city is shaped by its prevailing transportation technology, but freeways have affected Kansas City's development pattern in a completely different way than streetcars. Unlike a streetcar, which is an asset to the surrounding blocks and serves to connect the people and businesses in its immediate vicinity, a freeway damages the wealth of its surrounding blocks. It functions like a moat, dividing neighborhoods and depressing the value of the land right next to it, where people have to endure con constant noise and exhaust for the benefit of those driving at highest speed from relatively far away. And I think we can see that illustrated perfectly by living in an area where we're getting a streetcar system redeveloped yeah. where the streetcar there's new businesses popping up their business themed around the streetcar you know maine is just completely revitalized now you know power and light and all that there's all this new money and stuff whereas i mean there there's businesses all over the crossroads yeah which it, it, used to be from my memory granted as a child when last time i was in the crossroads when the streetcar wasn't really a thing mm -hmm. uh but it was usually a lot of empty well Businesses. I remember, and maybe this is because I'm more older than I was, but I remember dreading going down to Kansas City, you know, because uh, you have to drive and there's all, you know, it's city driving. There's all the one way roads and blah. It's, it's just a big pain. And a lot of the roads are old, like cattle roads that don't make any sense, like in Westport. But now it's like, well, I just drive. I go up to Union Station where I know it is. I park my car and then we just jump on the streetcar. Yeah. It, it's, I can sit on my phone. I can talk to my girlfriend. You know, it's just like. It's a lot more fun to be in downtown because I'm not having to manage traffic and drive everywhere, you know? And it's also interesting to think that probably one of the more hip neighborhoods or, like, I mean, not hip in, like, the fun, youthful way, but, like, hip in, like, the massive land values and yeah. uh, really popular houses is, you like know... Like the real estate value. Yeah, well, is Brookside and Waldo, which did have a streetcar running up and down it. For a very long time, there's actually something called the trolley trail. Mm, but yeah. if you look at houses there, they're they're it's a nice neighborhood, but like it's on par to any other part of, uh, you know, old Overland Park or old Prairie yeah. Village. Uh, but they're more expensive just because that the residual land value that came from that former public transit 
has made made it a more aesthetically nice walking neighborhood. Yeah. And there's more store options and there's a it's better to walk there because it was built to rely on an infrastructure that is no longer there. Yeah, but people still appreciate the yes. values that not maybe not values, but design principles that came from that other kind. Yes. Like like it still has its merits yeah, and the, you can see the the crucial part of that infrastructure is gone, but still the walkability and the niceness of it is there. Yeah. But, so well, in many ways, Matt, the choice to carve out Kansas City and to encircle and wall off its downtown with freeways is the most catas- cataclysmic planning mistake in the region's history. This is when Kansas City began to squander and dilute its wealth instead of continuing to build upon its rich heritage. You can't understand Kansas City's suburban experiment without understanding the world the freeways built. And if it's not being clear, when I kind of do a little lead-in like that and I kind of try to change my voice, I'm reading the article. Th- those aren't my words. I'm, I'm reading the article that we mentioned before. So I just want to make that clear. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know if our listeners have gone to Kansas City, but it is very much one of those oasises of cities surrounded by suburbs. I mean, yes. And, uh, do not to get even more in depth after telling everyone on the internet exactly what city we live in, but we are also, uh, children of the suburbs. Yeah. I mean, you kind of almost, I, I don't, I mean, there's like 2 million people that live in the Kansas city metro area, but it is the Kansas city metro area, yeah. which includes, you know, you got like Raytown, you got like Independence, you got like Lee Summit, Lee Summit, Overland Park, Olathe, Blue Valley, Prairie Village. Just a lot of people Gladstone. Are outside. Yeah. And yeah. And uh, I heard an interesting fact the other day uh, that Kansas City is uh, land size, like the actual like square miles is a, around the same size as New York City as a whole. I think I think you sent that to me, yeah. Yeah. Where they were saying like the if you if the density it, I think it mentioned Omaha too, where yeah. if, if Omaha, Nebraska had the same like housing density as what was it, some New York like borough? Like Queens or something? Brooklyn, I believe. Brooklyn. Like it would be like five square miles or something. Yeah. Whereas now it's like somewhere near a hundred square miles. Yeah. Because it's suburbs. I mean it's suburban strawl. But let's get into the crucial mistake. Freeways in the urban core. There is an important distinction between the two different types of freeways with two different purposes. There are true interstate highways built for intercity travel, long distance trips, and shipments of goods. Then there are local freeways built for intra city commuting, and other trips start to end within the same metro area. The former have provided intense economic benefits since their construction. The latter, though, have often been incredibly destructive to the collective wealth and community and stability. Are they talking about the 71 highway? I think so. I think they're talking about a lot of those just kind of ring highways, like 435 and stuff, where they don't necessarily need to exist. Yeah. Like, you could just have one big, you know, link going around the city with, like, smaller roads going in. You know, so that way, if you're commuting, you can go 70 miles an hour and just, you know, you're going 70 miles an hour. You curve around. It's a little bit more. But we have the intra city. You know, I use them every day yeah. to get to work and they're like convenient. But I go like two miles. Yeah, maybe. But it's just like three minutes faster. So why wouldn't I do it? And I'm sure it's incredibly wasteful. I'm like yeah. doxing myself. But it's just like at the end of the day, I mean, it's there. The city's designed around it. I can either jump on the highway for two freaking minutes or I can sit through 18 different stoplights. So yeah. I understand, but it's just like, well, while it's there, people are going to use it, you know? Yeah. The early version for a national highway system was of freeways that would connect major metropolitan areas but terminate at ring roads around the cities rather than penetrating the downtown core. That would have been a good idea. Yeah, that's what we just said, isn't it? Yes. The ring road model is the norm in Europe to this day. This debate occurred nationally, but in almost every city, the forces that wanted a downtown freeway, including influential real estate and business interests, won out, something that President Eisenhower, who signed the 1956 Highway Act, was reportedly surprised and dismayed by. Okay, so our theory from earlier that maybe Eisenhower wanted it was a bit... Uh, well, too it, it still stands. He he didn't want it going through downtown, but he yeah. probably, you know, all the interstates do go around Kansas City because 
I mean, it is a big city in the middle, so yeah. Uh, but that kind of surprised me a little bit, I guess, that he didn't. And I, 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 it, I'm at least happy that there was kind of a pushback, but also uh, see. And they say the debate occurred nationally. They don't really talk about. They just talk in school about. Yeah, the highway system was built, and it was a good thing. Yeah. And it was built, you know, during the Cold War, and it uh, connected the world, or not the world, the country. Yeah. But they never talk about the opponents to it, or why people would not want it, or other ideas for it, because obviously there's not that much time in school, and I think the Highway Act is like a sentence in your textbook. Yeah. But that's the thing is, it's like, why is it a sentence? Because it, you know, as this article is talking about, and as we've talked about in the last episode, it shapes so much of our history. Yeah, and and honestly, the Highway Act, uh, although declared finished, is not finished. Uh, they still constantly improve it. And hell, like yeah. I ninety five going up and down the East Coast wasn't finished until the late nineties to early two thousands. So yeah. like, it isn't like, oh yeah, the nineteen fifty six Highway Act, and then uh, now we have interstates, and it was just a snap right then and there. Yeah, it, it, it's like it's like a lot of things where we talk about it as if, well, it's something you know happened in fifty six. Yeah, it, you know, it was done like two years later, and it's over. Yeah. It's not a thing where it's like, no, it it's still a thing. I mean, we still dump money into it. We're still paying for it. It's still under development, like you said. It's, and, it's and, still and something most, that affects us. Most Americans drive on that uh, red and blue shield every single day. Yeah, I think every single person that lives in the United States that's listening to this podcast has had their lives affected by the Interstate Highway Act. It, whether it that's, might not be the most important thing, but it it affects you also whether that's good or bad uh if you were you know segmented by a highway which mm-hmm. has now destroyed your neighborhood and you maybe go back and read some books about what it used to be like or see the pictures i remember there's those like gray black and white books that you see in bookstores all the time especially around in kansas city where it's just like you know downtown kansas city and just a bunch of pictures from downtown kansas city or like westport and just all these pictures from the old times that you flip through and you're just like, wow, there were buildings here. Yeah, there were buildings here. Almost everybody used to live here. And then there was just like wilderness out where like we're sitting right now, you know? Yeah. Like there wasn't suburbs. There wasn't, you know, hundreds of miles of individual houses everywhere. There was a city and then there was, you know, people living out there, but like not mass amounts of people living in a giant area. But a detailed historical overview published in 2019 by the Kansas City Star illustrates that this debate was alive and well in Kansas City from the article. Previous generations of highway planners throughout thought, not throughout, thought that those highways should avoid urban areas, reasoning that merging of long distance and local traffic would create congestion. By the late 1930s, a new approach had been taken, had had taken root, I apologize, run the freeways right through the cities where congestion was attributed to short daily trips made by locals, not the pass-throughs of long-distance travelers. An early plan for its downtown loop was written into the City Plans Commission's 1943 reported suggested location of interstate, inter, not interstate, interstate, Inner regional highways, I swear I can read. <laughs> Beyond a lengthy verbal description of the route, it suggested passing the freeways through blighted areas that would be cheap to acquire. The highways, it said, could boost those areas economically, but also warned of the potentially disastrous impact on the already prosperous areas. Now, um, there's this really cool thing called imminent domain, and uh, maybe those blighted areas weren't actually blighted. They just had uh, more black people in them. Those highways, it said, could boost those areas economically by uh, turning them into asphalt, yes. apparently. like Hi, yes, boost our economy by uh, finding another home somewhere else. Well, there's certainly a lot more people driving now. Yeah. Um, I, sorry you're homeless, but uh, yeah. Jesus. I know there's a big uh, triangle where uh, I think it's I-29, uh, I-35, and 71 Highway all connect in Kansas yeah. City that just literally takes up space that probably a few thousand people used to live in. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially when you think that half of 
the areas that it's bisecting are like high density areas like you know they're not like houses right for the most part or even if they were houses those houses would have been better there than just the nothing in concrete i just mean like especially in like the 40s and 50s right especially in the 40s when they're talking about this like the suburb thing hadn't really been a thing so there wasn't especially in a city like this there wasn't necessarily that much like individual housing around the area there was mostly apartment complexes we're talking about it's probably hundreds of people the suburbs were uh brookside and waldo yeah so it, we're probably talking about thousands of people being displaced by, you know, just knocking down like 10 apartment complexes. Yeah. Uh, and it's the exact people that can't afford to be displaced. Yes. That's the reason that they're living in quote unquote blighted areas, you know. And unfortunately, that disastrous impact became reality. Kansas City embarked on a multi-decade highway building binge, including freeways that sl- which sliced up the existing city, displacing existing buildings and communities, in particular a loop of freeways encircling downtown. The blighted er areas identified in 1943 completely cut off downtown from urban neighborhoods around it. It had three devastating consequences. Consequence number one, direct destruction of prosperity and community assets. Property and community assets. Uh, So now there's another picture attached that's of... uh, the area that would be destroyed for the sixth street expressway photographed in 1949. And it's just like you picture in yourself, a 1940s movie, you know, black and white. It's just like, you know, a regular street corner, you know, everything is, looks like it's uh three stories tall. Yeah. Yeah. It's like somewhat high density. There's a bunch of buildings all attached to each other. And I don't think a single place exists in Kansas city that looks like this anymore. That I've seen, it's like N- not for this length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we got like street corners that still look like something like this, but uh, a lot of it's just like corporations now. There's no like like these are all like small business like liquor stores or like uh, what bodegas. I don't want to say bodegas because we're not in New York and I'm not pretentious, but. <laughs> Went to this great bodega. It's called Quick Trip. Yeah, right? <laughs> they sell gas, too. Isn't it incredible? Yeah, it's insane. You can buy gasoline and food. I <laughs> I hate bodegas. It's like it's like the most elitist. I have to have something different than, you know, everybody else. I live in New York, and we don't have, you know, convenience stores. We just have stores that sell food and drinks. There was a m- guy complaining at the gym this morning about the gym uh, this morning <laughs> yes about how uh the what was it there's a casey's of course they're uh, famous for pizza you know yeah but i'm a corporate uh, shell. A, a new one popped up in a new five over one built in uh a new rising hip neighborhood and uh it doesn't have gas and he was just like how can it be a casey's without gas and i'm just like sir it's still you know convenience store as well what do you think you walk into when you go to buy gas like that's still like a viable business it's only a casey's it's only not a casey's if it doesn't have the pizza yes that's the deciding line right there like 7-eleven doesn't have pizza it's not a casey's quick trip does have pizza therefore it's a casey's yep it's a casey's okay anyways uh, did you read this bit already? No, I did. Uh, downtown Kansas City's freeway loop itself required the direct destruction of more than 100 blocks of prime real estate. While many of these areas were believed in the 1940s to be blighted, the opportunity cost of what they could have been today is monstrous. While it would have taken some digging through historical property records to estimate that cost numerically, a similar analysis conducted by Urban 3 in Minneapolis found that the merely the buildings directly displaced for downtown freeways would be worth $655 million today. The entire streetcar network that we just rebuilt costs about $4 billion. Yeah. So just... And uh, the, the straight up, that's just what? The property values? Yeah. Not the business taxes you would get from each of every, all those mm-hmm. things. Also, Kansas City, which feeds itself off of the e-tax which is a 1% income tax, and uh, the amount of employees that would be paying that. Well, not only that, but also the money you'd save by not paying for the maintenance of freeways. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd be directly getting tax revenue and not be having a giant width of asphalt that you're spending money on. 
Speaking of which, uh, they're talking about that loop. Well, um, part of that loop is currently shut down, but because they built two parts of the loop, uh, the highway still works perfectly fine. So mm-hmm. clearly it's proven that uh, because they basically entrapped downtown KC into a circle of highways, uh, they made it so redundant that you could could possibly completely remove one of the loops and it would still function perfectly fine of minimal impact to people's commute. Well, there we go. But that would be annoying. Yeah, a little bit. Well, from the beginning, Matt, Kansas City's urban freeways were deliberately routed through areas that local leaders wanted raised and redeveloped. There is much of a tool of urban renewal land speculation as of mobility. For example, the northern edge of the downtown loop follows what was once 6th Street, despite that a nearby parallel route ran along the Missouri River was an option. A 1972 Star article, Kansas City Star, I believe, on the completion of the last portion of the loop refers to the infamous nickname that locals gave the construction zone along what would be 6th Street Expressway. It's a quote from the article. For a time, the area was referred to as Kansas City's Blitz. The mounds of fallen bricks and the gaping holes suggested that enemy bombers may have passed overhead the night before, which is exactly yeah. what we said, not knowing that they said that about that picture. It, yes. it looks like a freaking bomber went over. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, the Missouri River was an op- the parallel along was an option anyway because I've been down there and really there is some development and uh, particularly the KC Current which is going to is the female yeah, soccer team yeah. in Kansas City. Yeah, they are building that right the, there. They're aren't building they? a stadium there. It's an but option. uh if that was I was built there honestly what really da- what damage would really happen like honestly is most it- of that area is uh the river is decently gross and has a bunch of industrial decay around it anyway yeah i mean a lot of that area is yeah the industrialized where it's like if you have an elevated highway yeah there's not many people living out there that it's going to affect and it would probably make it more useful than it is now yeah (laughs) but um well even a park with one of the city's most commanding views, West Terrace Park, was not immune to freeway mania. And in 1966, Interstate 35 was rammed along the base of the bluffs west of the downtown adjacent and not coincidentally deemed blighted Quality Hill neighborhood, effectively splitting the park into three units. And then they have a link to a full history of that, which 35, yeah, that's yeah. that's the one. That's And uh, uh, when I went to the... Uh, what is it? the Johnson County uh, History Museum when they had the little display about redlining? They did yeah. talk about Quality Hill and they show a picture before and then they pictures after. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been to Quality Hill now, and uh, the redevelopment, uh, the buildings they showed after the redevelopment, they're still there. But other than that, I mean, it, it's kind, it's a, it's a nice neighborhood, but it's relatively small and it looked like it was very much larger in the pictures and could hold way more people. It's like a lot of this is like almost sunk cost fallacy of, well, we have these things and it would cost money to get rid of them. Yeah. So we may as well just keep dumping money into keeping them because I mean, we have them when it's like the amount of money and income and tax revenue and land we would have. Like if we just didn't, yeah, you know, it would like, I, I don't know. Because now what businesses are in uh, Quality Hill other than what a Mexican restaurant, the original Peanut, uh, and a Catholic church? The original Peanut. Well, don't don't talk too bad about that. This place has really good wings. I'm looking it up on the map so I know exactly what you're talking about. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's right there. Okay. So it's semi-close to the, where the streetcar is now. Like semi-close it's a couple blocks yeah. away but holy cow yeah oh I, i've walked to the streetcar from that park that you're looking at where yeah. the where the jim printergast statue is jim printergast yeah or pendergast pendergast who the hell is this guy uh probably some i don't know probably paid money in the city the, yeah the, the they're an they're an entire story of their own uh we're not gonna get into them that family is wild Pendergast. Well, in the eastern, 
historically black portion of Kansas City, the economic and cultural damage wrought directly by freeways was severe. Over the course of 50 years, the Highway 71 freeway was built through historically black redlined neighborhoods in order to, according to a recent KCUR retrospective, I don't know who KCUR are. That is the NPR nation, uh, oh, station. Oh, it's KC. Okay, I know yes. who KCUR are. I just never heard them refer to as KCUR. Anyways, uh, the retrospective connects people in Lee's Summit, Grandview, and the Northland to downtown. That is, to serve suburban commuters. More than 10,000 people would be displaced for Highway 71's construction. So I was guessing like just a couple thousand earlier were displaced. Yeah. 10,000. For, for 71 Highway, which um, anyone who's driven down 71 Highway is, uh, it, it, I mean, it, 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 it's a highway. Yeah. I mean, it, it does have stoplights on it, which is kind of annoying. But uh, I, I can't get over the fact that we have all these highways and all this money and all this development, all this stuff we've torn out. But yet, if I'm going, you know, north to Kansas City and I want to go like, you know, you're going up, you take a right where like the Liberty Memorial is, but you can't do that. You have to get off the highway and get back on and then you can go turn. You know, over like by where like KU Med is and stuff. Yeah. I don't remember exactly which highway that is, but it's just like it doesn't even work. You can't like go east from that northbound highway. I think it's uh, 35. It's like they didn't even like connect it. You have to get off the highway. to. T- <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <sighs> but you know progress more details on displacement for freeways are included in race real estate and uneven development the kansas city experience 1900 to 2000 by kevin fox gotham gotham documents more than 12,000 households displaced from the 1950s to the early 1970s alone for urban renewal and freeway construction 28.6 percent of those households were black even though only 12.2% of the population of Kansas City in 1950 was black. Gotham recounts residents' memories of black businesses in the Lincoln Colts area destroyed for freeway clearance. And the thing, I've never heard that neighborhood name before, Mm -hmm. probably because it was destroyed. Well, they actually have a, a picture of it here, I believe. It's Vine and 24th near 71, and they have a picture of a Street View uh, screenshot. It's not a picture they took. It's just from Street View, and it's of an area they described as what used to have been an economic center for black businesses, which now appears to be a field, Cause, uh, and it's a fenced-in field at that, and it appears that there's not really anything Spinning around left, except for there's a minivan stopped. Um, which is kind of funny. I think, yeah, there's some apartments behind where the camera was, but, th- but those look very new. Yeah, they they're like five. That's like five over one, right? Yeah, it it looks like it, it's just a three story, most uh, pretty recently built apartment building. It's brick, but it's like there's nothing here anymore. Uh, go to the main map view so I can see exactly where this is. Um, it is oh. there apparently. Yeah. Where's Vine? 24th and Vine. So it's like right here. Well, well, that is... Oh, no, it's it's like here-ish. And the highway runs right by we, it. And we have Google Maps. And, and, and it's, right, it's right by the Paseo, which is a fairly large and usually... Actually, and it's only a few blocks down from 19th and Vine, mm-hmm. uh, which, if you know anything about Kansas City history, was a big jazz area yeah. and is uh, home to a jazz museum. Which I need to go to. Yes, it I is. I've heard really good things about it. I just haven't found a free weekend to go yet. Yes, it it is. Uh, it's been a while since I went, but I remember it being very good. You saw Buck O'Neill got uh, inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame yesterday, by the way? Yes, that is awesome. Very I was overdue. also at Hy-Vee, and they were talking about donating to some like fund because Buck O'Neill got inducted or whatever. I don't well, that's know. good. Yeah. yeah, he's cool. Anyways. Rest uh, in peace. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the quote from the people who were displaced by 71 Highway, there had been semi-economic centers for black businesses that were around 12th Street, 18th Street, coming up Vine, say to 25th Street, because I remember Barker's Market. 
Johnson's Drug Store and a cab company and a bunch of stuff like that. And all of the clientele was in walking distance, mainly because in the 1940s and early 1950s, people lived closer together. With urban renewal and people moving out, eh, they lost their clientele. And that is from Mary Jacqueline interview with author. So that's the author of uh, Race, Real Estate, and Uneven Development, I believe. Which is, which is Kevin Fox Gotham. Yeah. Which sounds very good. We should read that at some point. Um, so we're on to number two of our points of the three consequences of urban freeways, which is indirect loss of value and vitality in adjoining areas. And it says that the damage done by urban freeways is not limited to the exact land on which they sit. Freeways also exert a depressing effect on land values and economic activity in the surrounding areas because they're unpleasant to be around and can be formidable barriers to walking and other local travel. And then they have linked a map from geoanalytics firm Urban3, which I believe is referenced above. It's, I think, from Minneapolis. And it's of land value per acre in the vicinity of Kansas City's modern streetcar, which is the new one we kind of talked about on Maine. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously it's uh, just massive skyrocketing to the moon of property value. Uh, what, is that, what does that pink say? Uh, $10 million. And that's taxable value per acre dollar. So it, it increased, it, one building increased $10 million in property taxable value. And uh, there, it's almost all the way across the entire line of the streetcar. I mean, that's power and light, right? That is power and light. But also look down the crossroads because there's a bunch of smaller purple ones down there. Yeah. And then there's obviously... Oh, that the Union is. Station itself increased too. Well, yeah, because well, you had no point of really going to Union Station unless you're going to Science City or some exhibition hall. Oh, they have trains. Well, <laughs> they yeah, still they, do. They, 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 they have four trains that arrive per day that you can ride. Yeah, uh, all at the and, worst possible times. Yes, and uh, a train station that used to have massive volumes of people coming through it uh, that uh, was the it, ending it, destination of uh, you know presidents, foreign dignitaries foreign generals, American generals. It's a beautiful train museum that is way too big for what it's used for now, which it has a restaurant and I believe a chocolate store. Yes, and it, it it's, uh, uses some extra parts, which used to be train platforms as a little exhibition hall to have little exhibitions in it. Yeah. And then yeah. a little side area, which has a children's science museum, which, which is okay. It's a, it's a cool children's museum when I was a child. Yeah. I thought it was cool. But yeah, basically, streetcar equal your land value go up. Public transit equal you get more business. It's funny how that works. I mean, yeah. it's like brand new. You know, wow. Who would have thought? I, I'm always confused about why it takes uh, so much surveys to convince people after doing the survey for the uh, the northern extension of the streetcar. Mm. When really, what really, what surveys you need to do? You could just basically go to every person along that thing. Like, hey, this is how much you'll you'll make. 10 million more dollars on your property right here it's like if we build this it's like okay so here you go the kansas city streetcar i believe had an annual ridership the past few years of about 25 million people i believe something like that the population of kansas city is 2 million think about that i mean it's like if your business is along a streetcar line you're having like the annual pop, you know, the population of Kansas City, like I can't do math, like five times over going past your business on a streetcar, yeah. looking out the window. Hey, I've never heard of that restaurant before. You want to go there? Okay. Hello. Would you like free money? Well, let us build this thing and you For, will, you know, a, okay. Five billion dollars. Okay. That's a lot of tax money distributed amongst all the people along that. Okay. That's a lot of money. You're going to make a lot more than that once it's done. How many uh, of those 10 millions do we need to do to get the $5 billion? Uh, let's see. We got 5 million, 50 million, 500 million, 5 billion. Let's do that. And then divide it by 10, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million? 10 million. Uh, 500. So. Cool. So just 500 businesses, they don't have a list of how many, but it's not an insignificant amount. And there's a lot more. There's definitely more than 500 that had an increase of at least like three to two to one million. So 
that's a lot. I mean, you're making your money back. I'll guarantee you that. So they say on the article that the gray, rec- bleh, the gray rectangles immediately adjacent to the downtown loop represent parking lots, which, of course, if you pull up the article, you can see the image we're going to be referencing. But we're just going to read this so that you article can kinda, will be linked, by the way. Yeah. Just imagine it in your mind if you're not going to read it. They represent parking lots, which are extremely low value land uses. This adds to the no man's land effect already caused by the freeway itself. But the parking creator is not all. Notice the depressed value of properties in the area number three, which is labeled as drop off in value per acre just outside loop, uh, compared to areas immediately to the south or to the downtown core north of the freeway. This steep drop off in value represents the moat effect of a freeway, which tends to stop prosperity in its tracks, limiting the example of a downtown's productivity into the rest of the city. Because surprise, surprise, asphalt doesn't really bring in too much tax revenue. Nope. And, uh, Speaking of asphalt, uh, what was it, a week ago? There was another uh, tweet from the Casey Streetcar Twitter account about trucks oh, blocking yeah, yeah, the yeah. line. <laughs> yeah. uh, and one of them had a parking lot literally visible right across the sidewalk. So yeah, was, you could see it wasn't five feet away. Yeah, and it's sure you would probably have to pay for it. But, like, you know, Kansas City is ample parking. Yeah, which to our valuable listeners, of course— uh, the streetcar runs in the street, so if you have your car parked on the curb and it's too far over, the streetcar obviously or, can't get past. Or if you have your massive uh, pickup diesel pickup truck parked in the street and yeah. you put wide tires on it and you lifted it and you drive a literal monster truck on the street and you decide to park it next to a free parking lot that might cost money, might be free. I don't exactly yeah, know. It's like, it's and like, block the streetcar instead. Yeah, I think parking goes like 10 maybe $20. Probably cheaper in that area. But you know what's more expensive than that is replacing a billion-dollar streetcar when your or car damages it. your towing tow- cost, yes. yes. <laughs> well, number three on their list of the most important impacts are a vicious cycle of outward expansion and dilution of the region's financial productivity. And they say that large parts of Kansas City began to suffer population decline as residents moved to newly accessible suburbs. Now a 20 minute commute from downtown on a wide open freeway, which I can verify it's about 20 minutes. Soon the freeways were not serving the quote long distance travelers, some planners envision, but predominantly suburban commuters like me. It's a lot easier to drive on a highway to go to work than it is to drive through all the stoplights, even though it's probably terrible for the environment. But yeah. Sue me. Kansas City's freeway binge occurred over time and in tandem with the city's annexation binge described in the first installment of this series, which this is an ongoing series from uh, this website. That is no accident. It's a classic chicken and egg scenario. Again, from the Kansas City Star, they quote, A 1951 report on freeway plans also noted the 1950s shift in residential population of the suburbs. City manager Cookin... L.P. Cookingham. Cookingham? L.P. Cookingham. Oh, my God. Uh, New, 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 new suburbanites... Suburbanites. New, new suburbanites. Jeez would need high-speed roads to get them in and out of the city as efficiently as possible. The city manager also began aggressively annexing unincorporated land south and north of the river to retain taxpayers who were moving. With that came greater city control and over the area's expressway system. That's how Kansas City acquired the same square miles as uh, New York City. Yeah, they just were like, well, people are moving out to suburbs, so let's just take the suburbs and there's also uh now well there's city residency laws for city employees yeah so now like if you want to have the suburb aesthetic but still live in casey you just go across the river to uh the northland in clay county and you can still live within casey mo city limits but be in a place that looks like you know lee summit or overland park because i guess that doesn't and maybe it does get talked about but i don't think about it that often but just you know, the people moving out to the suburbs from the cities, you know, millions of people moving out. Yeah. Just the amount of tax revenue that every single major city in the United States lost at that time. It's like, you know, maybe that does explain, like, you know, the New York, the issues they were having, like the 50s, 60s, 70s and stuff. With, yeah. st- I don't live in New York, but like maybe it's just like a massive lock of loss in tax revenue that hasn't been replicated since. And that's why the city's, you know, doing better. Yeah. But uh, th- that massive la- loss of tax revenue for all those cities, it came back to New York. It didn't come back to Kansas City. It didn't come back to any other major yeah. city. Uh, also, I re- 
if I remember this correctly, uh, my college professor in one of my classes said during the white flight situation in Kansas City where everyone's moving out to the suburbs, uh, Kansas, City, for? Kansas City Public Schools uh, built these absolutely massive, just the best schools they could possibly build in the hopes that people would stay because Casey Public Schools just built this absolutely beautiful like yeah. with all the amenities that the 1950s and 60s could offer high school or middle school or elementary school and it didn't work and that's kind of the reason why Kansas City has a uh, you know you can drive in a neighborhood that's now new and very nice uh, near Broadway Gilham and uh, there'll be a massive abandoned high school well right. and you point that out but what else happened with schools in the 50s that might have driven people to not want to go back just for a really nice school? Uh, racism. Yeah, you know, yeah. you got this great school, but it's desegregated, so I better move out to the suburb, you know, where it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, back to the article. Kansas City had committed by the end of the 1950s to an ideology of rapid outward growth, and the linchpin of this approach was the urban freeway network. The only thing that made it possible to link a vast belt of commuter suburbs to office jobs still concentrated downtown. Now, I will say, um, the issue with the plan of outward growth, which uh, L.P. Cookingham obviously was, his plan was basically gop of his land as, as much land as possible in order to keep people in city limits. Uh, the issue I see is, uh, if you look at a map and where Kansas City, Missouri is located, uh, it's a stone's throw away from a state called Kansas. Oh, yeah. Uh, in that. which you could probably build a uh, massive uh, suburb system over there where Kansas City, Missouri can't touch because yeah. can, a, a city in Missouri cannot annex land in the state of Kansas. Hmm. Uh, and you can create your own you know, suburban paradise over there. So if you simply move on the other state line... They can't incorporate you over there because you're in a different state. Yes, and then you can implement whatever rules you want, and you can keep uh, your schools exactly how you want them. And then you get one of the richest counties in Kansas being a suburb. Yes. Hmm. That, that's specifically designed to avoid any uh, obligations in the paying into the system Kansas City has, but uh, still benefits from the economic uh, power Kansas City still maintained. Because yeah. there's a bunch of people, including uh, almost if you are a person from Johnson County, you know a person from Johnson County, m most of your parents, or probably grandparents, because there's a bunch of jobs moving out to Joko, but most of your parents or grandparents basically commuted to Kansas City, Missouri, to work, and then came back in to Joko to live and spend time and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, where is it? I'm looking something up. So, you know, you could obviously. Aha. So now, our dear listeners, you may not know anything about Kansas or Kansas City. And that's why we do this, because we're very obscure. You know, not that we, we won the national championship. The Jayhawks did. But, you know, we don't have that much going on other than the Chiefs. Uh, but if you look up the wealthiest counties in the United States per capita, right? So obviously we don't have 8 million people like New York city. Uh, Johnson County, Kansas uh, is number 81 on that list. So it's not, we, we mentioned, okay, all the money and stuff. And it's not exactly like country bumpkin nonsense. It's like, no, we're, we're up there. I mean, we're what orange County, California is number 79. James, Co James city County, Virginia is number 80. And then we're above, like, Powhatan County, Virginia. So it's not exactly, like, bad. Com I don't know anything about those counties, actually. I shouldn't say that. But, uh, yeah, it's like, if, if you got this image of your mind of Kansas and Missouri and Kansas City, I guarantee you that this part we're talking about is probably not what you're thinking unless you've been there, okay? Now, I have something to uh, bring up. The speaking of that income per capita, uh, the income per capita I have from the U.S. Census Bureau is the income per capita income in KC Mo for the past 12 months in 2020 dollars is thirty three thousand dollars. Is thirty three? Thirty three. Thirty three. Thirty three. 
And the one I just read off, number 81, that brings it up to 73,733. So uh, the county... More that, than double. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, if you work in within the city limits of KCMO, you pay a 1% income tax uh, on whatever money you like earn from your paycheck. So if you work within KCMO city limits, 1% is going to go to the city. But if you're making, per ca- if your per capita income... For example, is seventy three thousand dollars. You take one percent of that. That's money that goes back to Kansas City, Missouri, and you just drive back to Overland Park or Leewood or whatever. And they and say spend your money at Joko restaurants. Yeah, and they say, you know, in the article they just said, you know, the office job still concentrated downtown. But and and you think office job, okay, a lot of money. But then you read the statistic, and it's like, oh no, it's actually thirty thousand. Yeah. So it's not exactly. Because all, all the wealth has moved outside the city. Cause, yeah, because yeah, everyone that works at that job concentrated downtown is going to live in uh, that county that we've mentioned that is, you know, the nice suburb. Yeah, which is on the Kansas side. Yeah. yeah. So, well, we should probably continue. Uh, so today, fewer people live in Kansas City's pre-1946 borders than did in 1946. The core cities of both Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas, have seen stagnant populations even as they have dramatically expanded their borders and infrastructure obligations. And the dilution of public wealth relative to private liability is even more dramatic when you look at the metro as a whole, where nearly all growth since World War II has occurred in the suburbs. The small towns visible on the 1947 highway map above, Olathe, Lenox, Lee Summit, etc., which there's a highway map above in the article, uh, are all bedroom communities of tens of thousands of people today, which I believe was at Overland Park is the second highest populated city in Kansas? Yeah, the, the second largest city in Kansas by population is Overland Park. Because number one is Wichita, which w- has about 300,000. Well, Wichita is an actual city, though. Overland yes. Park is just a... Uh, I lived in Wichita, yeah. It is an extremely overgrown suburb that is able to govern itself that basically depends pretty strongly on being a suburb of Kansas City. If you have access to Google Maps and you don't know the area, go on Google Maps, go to downtown Wichita, go on Street View. It's big, you know, there's big buildings, there's big office buildings. Now go to downtown Overland Park, go to Street View. There's not really a downtown Overland Park. (laughs) It's like suburbs. I mean, it's it, like, it's entirely a sea of bait, what looks like green with a bunch of houses in it. Yeah, it, it's like as low density as they can possibly make it. You know, the highest density part is people who have like ten kids. Yeah, yeah. So, or the the few apartment complexes that are scattered around it. Yeah. Uh, do they have like height limits? I don't think so because. The, I've I've seen. Or do uh, people just not build? I, I think there's two or three five over ones they built in downtown OP, which it downtown OP is like a like a street. Yeah, I mean, um, but yeah. it, it, there's a few of those there. Um, I mean, I know there's an office complex right over, uh, like like has a like a pretty big tower that has like a copper roof and stuff, and it's yeah. kind of cool looking. But that's also like an office complex. Yeah, so it's not really residential living. Well, so. It is here in the areas, the small towns that we're talking about, Olathe, Lenex, Lee Summit. It's here that it becomes clear who stood to benefit from urban core freeways. Large-scale developers and land speculators who reaped an enormous windfall over the decades. The freeways enacted a net transfer of land value to the builders of those bedroom communities, which found themselves with faster access to Kansas City than ever before. It was Kansas City itself that lost out, where land values flatlined, including in many of the, quote, already prosperous areas, unquote, where the outcome was feared as early as 1943, which we've been talking about this entire time is, yeah, just the city has lost millions of dollars of tax revenue from all the people who moved out, but the people that moved out still use the assets in the city. They're still yes. driving the highway and stuff, but they're and not actually contributing any cash towards it. Well, they, is, they, they do contribute if they work within KC most of the limits, they pay a yeah. 1%, 1% income tax. But like nobody would, you know, not going to live there. So a certain class of downtown high rise developers and commercial interests also gained. They were able to, for a while, cement downtown's primacy as the region's job and retail core. But even downtown Kansas City has not always kept pace with the suburbs, where an increasing share of jobs and retail have shifted to cater to suburbanites who no longer wish to drive into Kansas City proper at all. Yep. Yep. And I love driving into Kansas City because it's great, but it's just 
that's the issue is there's less and less to do, which the streetcar has helped with, but it's just... Yeah. And also that line does make sense because uh, if you think about, you know, people you know jobs and our jobs and whatnot, uh, all of them mainly are not actually in Kansas City anymore. They're in Johnson County. Yeah. Well, the article's almost done. There's... In a 2019 article with KCUR, Matt Staub, chair of the city's Parking and Transportation Commission, Kansas City's, and vice president of the River Market Community Association, expressed regret that the downtown loop was ever built. He said, where we put highways and where we tore down buildings was all about, we're going to create a city for another generation. But really, we just killed it for a generation. End quote. And that's the end of the article. That's depressing. Yeah. I'm sad. Me too. Now, the author, Daniel Harridge, is, I don't think he's from Kansas City, actually. Uh, what is it? He grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, before moving to San Francisco Bay Area and then to Sarasota, Florida, where he currently lives. Not to dox him, but he's, I mean, his face is publicly on the article. It's kind of interesting, writing an entire article about that. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I do welcome people's interest in Kansas I, City. I, okay, don't move here because rent is already expensive but come visit it's great i mean yeah. we're a great town if if it's just yeah the, the highways you, you, you're probably gonna need to rent a car to be completely honest yeah you and, can't walk anywhere i mean we and, have a and, street car the street car is about two miles long we talked about it extensively in the previous episode and if you are a foreign traveler who is keeping up with world cup news oh, and yeah. you know that there's going to be a world cup game in kansas city um I would, and you were planning on going or thinking about going, I would go ahead and keep in mind that you probably need to uh, secure yourself a hotel uh, in Raytown, Missouri. Yes. Okay. And well, also rent a car because the uh, solution that Kansas City has is providing express line buses. Yes. We have a few listeners in the UK and other areas like that, Belgium. If you're coming to Kansas City, for the World Cup, which we're hosting a few of the games in 2024. It could be, I don't know how the World Cup works. I don't watch soccer, but we could be hosting your game. I think we have like six teams that are going to be coming. Don't get a hotel ticket in Kansas City, Kansas, because Kansas City proper is in Missouri, and the stadium the World Cup will be in will be, as Matt said, in Raytown. So plan accordingly. Don't just think, oh, Kansas City, there's a state called Kansas, you know got to think and we do not have very good public transit so yeah ubers lifts rent a car rent a car uh make an american friend who has a car or yes. uh also if you want to save money because i think they might raise uh the amount of rates that renting a car will cost in oh, the Kansas City metro yeah. area you could fly into a completely different city that doesn't have a world cup game rent a car there and then road trip see that's how you do it that will uh Please prepare yourself for probably over eight hours of driving because America is a very big place. Yeah, there's uh, St. Louis, which is, yeah, like four or five, six hours going west. Uh, well, it's St. Louis is east of us. Yeah, but you're go you'd be you, going, you'd west. Be going I, west. That, that's what I meant. Uh, that's pretty much <laughs> that's yeah. like the closest big city. Uh, uh, Denver. Would, which would, yeah, be, which like, would be eight hours. Yeah, eight hours. Uh, you can fly into Min uh, Minneapolis. That's, uh, yeah, like eight hours. Which also is also is eight hours. So, yeah. Well, yeah. So just be warned. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's what we have on this topic. If you guys have any comments, concerns, questions, as always, uh, go ahead and send us an email. Cleo History Podcast at gmail.com. It'll be linked below. We don't have any emails yet, so if you send one in, we'll be guaranteed to respond. You will have our full attention. <laughs> uh, go ahead and follow us on Twitter, too, at Cleo History. Uh, that'll also be linked. I think we link those every single time. So uh, we, I'm not going to say update often, but we update sometimes. Uh, but that's your best place to uh, get any kind of actual updates because that's our only social media. Well, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy these uh, more freeform episodes, and uh, we'll, I guess, talk to you next time. Yeah, see you on the flip side.